Hi guys, good evening. This is Dr. Jenny Yusuf, physical therapist and doctor of physical therapy, board certified specialist in geriatrics physical therapy. So it's once again, thanks God, it's Thursday. Every Thursday, we highlight innovators, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and academicians. We even have innovators once. Um, we even have audiologists at one point. So anywhere globally, we invite and highlight uh, for our Thanks God is Thursday. And today and tonight, wherever you are, if you're in Philippines, magandang umaga. And once again, if you're in U.S., good evening. All right. So assalamu alaikum for my friends in Saudi Arabia and you. UAE. For tonight's guest, we have none other than Dr. Ken Tanfinko. Dr. Ken is a physical therapist, doctor of physical therapist, and also he is more than 19 years as a physical therapist. And he is also a therapeutic pain specialist. And that's what we will talk about more about pain science. And you know how important to know what is pain, how we as clinicians need to understand what our clients are talking about and knowing that we don't really feel what they're talking about, right? So, and also he is a certified in orthopedic manual physical therapist and Maitland in Australia and a certified false specialist, all right? So he is the representative ambassador and expert in his um, PH in PIH hospital. So he is the one doing some educational and also do some, especially in vestibular rehab, all right? So without further ado, we would love to learn more with you, Dr. Ken. How are you? Welcome to Balance and Fall Support Group and Fisigen PP. Oh, uh, hi, Jenny. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. And uh, really honored, I think, that you, you'd asked me to even come on uh, and, and joining you with this conversation here. But I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yes, yes. I'm so excited and I value your experience and also your expertise. So for, for people who doesn't really know you, you're based in California. So tell us a little bit more on your, what is your day-to-day -day, um, cases in PIH hospital, knowing that you're the senior lead therapist and also your um, expert in the vestibular area right now. Uh, I, I may change that a little bit. I, I may not be an expert, by the way, for, for those things. Uh, we do actually have uh, uh, two therapists in there that see primarily the vestibular uh, in, in, in my hospital. But my setting is mostly in the outpatient uh, spine care center. So we see a lot of uh, the most mostly low back and lumbar area type, type of diagnoses, uh, sometimes cervicogenic and thoracic, but basically everything within the spine and uh, I'm partnered up with, with the, there, is a, there is a primary therapist over there uh, that I sort of um, look up to as, as a bit of a mentor. And he is uh, the one who basically got my mindset on the way I like and enjoy practicing over there. So it's a, it's a very forward clinic. It's probably the most forward I've seen to where they, they allow us to be able to practice things that are brand new and coming out in research uh, and apply it right away. Uh, and I know there's there's a lot of lulls in being able to apply research up to uh, maybe a decade or more sometimes when research is it starts trickling down and becoming more mainstream into our clinics. Uh, but I, I feel really, really uh, super excited that uh, I, I work in this environment and I get to uh, apply, you know, things I, I get to read about right away. Yes, yes. That's really good, especially your knowledge and your passion in knowing what is pain science. It strikes me every time we have some conversation, Facebook and also articles, I always value your um, comments and recommendations with the group. So tell us more, why did you do your certification and why it strikes you the most? What motivates you to take the therapeutic pain specialty? Um, why it's important for us clinicians? Yeah, I, I, I basically got tired of being able to not give very good answers when patients were, were asking me, why does this hurt and why am I hurting over here and why is it lasting so long? Uh, I used to give a lot of biomedical, um, bioanatomic-based uh, models. I, I can kind of go a little bit 
about that uh, in, in this. I, I put together maybe a 15 minute or so presentation. Hopefully I can get it through it in 15 minutes because I tend to get wordy. So that's where you'll have to uh, uh, give me the signal sometimes to, yes. <laughs> to move to the next slide. Uh, sure, but sure. I, I basically got tired of giving uh, answers that were, were not um, scientifically accurate when I was trying to explain why somebody's hurting. And I, I always thought that if, um, if I can give much better answers, uh, they would appreciate it more. Uh, getting those kind of things. So it's the patient that uh, motivates you mm -hmm. for you to be better because I really need the direct point, answer them straightly. So I really need to do this certification, get more answers and deliver to them. So go ahead um, for this. I think you provided us a wonderful presentation about neurological or pain science. So go ahead, um, Dr. Ken. Show us your um, PowerPoint and webinar. And thank okay. you so much for doing this for us, especially for us clinicians. We're really now looking I, forward. Mm -hmm. I'd like this to be a bit more conversational too. So if, if yeah. somewhere along the slide, you come up with a mm -hmm. question or something comes up, you're more than welcome to ask. Uh, yes. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I think uh, some of the, I shared some of our presentation already, even just talking with you. And I, I, I tend okay. to like uh, a, a back and forth discussion kind of thing too. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, there we go. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yes, I don't know if you're able to see it right now. Uh, I see it. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is, um, Originally, Jane was asking me if I might be able to do a presentation that uh, talk more about what pain neuroscience education is. And right now, I'm slowly starting to hear other clinicians talk about it. So I think that it's more mainstream now than, than it originally was. And basically, pain neuroscience education, if you were to just get directly to what, what, what it means, is that you're, you're trying to explain pain to a person who's asking questions about it. Uh, using scientific, um, I guess, methodology. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I was a little bit guilty of not being able to do that as well uh, in the past. And I think it's one of the best things that have really changed the way I practice. Uh, yeah. So, so can I still have the top, huh? Those like the Google. So... You, re you oh, were okay, able to minimize it. Yeah, okay. You were able to minimize it before. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Can we edit that out later? <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 So, right, next slide. Yeah, that's fine. So, again, thank you for having me uh, and sharing your evening with me. Uh, I decided to name this one Applying Pain Neuroscience Education rather than talking about what it is. Uh, I, I wanted to see if we can give examples on how to apply it uh, toward our patients. Um, this is just a quick disclaimer that I want to make sure that the, the You're a little bit thoughts, the views, the expressions I have are primarily my own, uh, usually evolving. So some of the things I say right now, or for just right now, for the moment, because we know how fast uh, education changes, and we know how fast evidence moves nowadays. And what I say now may not be applicable even in six months or so. These learning objectives, basically, uh, It's going to include number one to learn what patients want to know, uh, and then finally number three would be to learn why it is important to be able to answer these questions in in that manner. I saw this primarily patients. Did uh, physical therapist, occupational therapist, their care provider, basically. That was added later on by, by Adrian Lowe. And that one 
one would be how much will it cost? You know, so that I thought it's a very easy question to answer. It, basically, the copay and the amount of times potentially that the person may come in. There's also a lot of macro studies out there by the CDC that show large charts showing that unfortunately, when you when you see those trends, uh, the amount of money back pain costs the, uh, the society, uh, like the United States or the world as a whole, and despite the the, the cost going up and us pouring more money into it by getting MRIs and getting all this new extra fancy medication to try to combat it, it seems to not be getting much better. Than that. Uh, so uh, number one would be, um, you know, what's wrong with me is what the patient might ask me. Uh, and this can sometimes be also heard as or rephrased as, why do I hurt? You know, why is my back bothering me so much? Uh, this is where P, and I'm going to refer to pain neuroscience education as P and E. The clinician is trying to answer now uh, the patient's question. Uh, it's It's really they just fell off a ladder, uh, and then they ran into the, their hip ran into the ground. It's it's really easy off a ladder, uh, and then they ran into the, their hip ran into the ground. And now their back is starting to bother forward. Long-standing pain, maybe for 10, 20, sometimes 25, 30 years, will come in, uh, saying that they hurt themselves when they were just before turning into a teenager, and it's carried over. Their back pain has gotten worse and worse over the last 20 to 30 years. You know, so when you try to give a simplistic answer, it doesn't work very well because we we know that we know now that that the uh, the the pain that somebody feels and the prediction of where it's going to go uh, is, is going to be based on primarily the history and how long they they've had to deal with something like that. Uh, so trying to explain sometimes. Uh, a simplified, uh, minimalistic answer toward a person who's had long-standing pain. We find out now that it has a side effect of producing what's called a, a nocebo effect, uh, mm -hmm. and this is just sort of like a negative effect that can sometimes end up amplifying their symptoms to become even worse. Uh, and th these people sometimes will have seen multiple conditions. They've had multiple injections. They've had multiple treatments that sometimes have necessarily worked, or maybe they work temporarily, but then their symptoms continue to become worse in there. So this is where it might be one of the best uh, uh, ways to answer questions, particularly in those people who have who, who ask the tough, hard questions to our to the clinicians. Uh, and uh, I think back then when I couldn't answer it very well, it was easy to potentially burn out because none of the answers could apply to somebody like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we'll kind of get a, a little bit of examples later on and maybe how to do those things uh, when somebody yes. asks those questions too. So number two is how long will, will it take to get better? You know, and I generally like giving the, the normative timeline for, for bone healing. I think <laughs> physio Fooders has a, has a guideline out there. It shows that, uh, you know, basic bones will heal in about 90 days or so to be mm -hmm. well remodeled and muscles will take about six months, uh, tendons, nine months and ligaments about a year or so. And this happens to people who are in prime optimal healing conditions uh, mm -hmm. that are able to follow these guidelines, I think. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, especially people who have non-unions and delayed healings, yeah. diabetes, uh, other underlying, you know, uh, systemic medical conditions that could end up influencing their tissues to, and bones to regenerate back that quickly. Uh, so number three, is there anything that I can do to help uh, get it better? Uh, and this is the patient asking what they can do to help themselves. Uh, there, there are actually a ton of things that people can do. And when you when you answer a question like, why does my back hurt? And I, and my, my old me would have said, well, probably because you have a disc bulge over there or you have fissures that have been seen on the MRI. 
And when you give an answer like that, it limits them to, well, what can I do about the fissures then? What, what can I do to reduce my, my disc herniation then? Well, you could do these exercises and you can do this exercise, but then you'd be stuck, maybe not being able to expand any more than that. And there's a lot of evidence out there that shows now where um, when you combine multiple things, uh, pro provide number one, like a safe healing environment for them to be able to bounce back in and recover in. You apply neural mobilizations to start feeding uh, more blood, more nutrients toward the nerves. Yoga has also been shown that when you integrate sometimes some of the stretches and the poses that a person mm -hmm. is able to do and they feel better about it, relaxation, breathing exercises, aquatic therapy, uh, coping skills, and even journaling, something like that can be mm -hmm. part of a th therapeutic approach. Uh, so you can see that now instead of just doing a set specific bit of exercises, you now can expand to a whole array of things that we know uh, all influence pain a as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not just stuck with a single thing. And if it doesn't work now, what else are you going to do uh, into it? Uh, the, the other one or the last one here is number four. Is there is there anything you can do or give me to help it? You know, so yes, uh, I'm here to be your guide, basically. And I'm here to be able to coach you through uh, these hard things. And I'm here to be able to change the prescription, allow you to be able to adapt into it. If we're sh if you're going through a tough time that you're not showing you can adapt very well, we're here to make adjustments mm -hmm. into it so that you can continue to adapt and move forward in there. Okay. Uh, so uh, th those are those are the big the big main ones that are in there. And I think that was the busiest slide I had. Everything is now all downhill from here. Yeah. Again. I, I I like when you say the time frame because it didn't uh comes to my mind like ligament I I usually don't really make an exactly a time frame oh ligament usually a year and then the bone usually is like this and muscles are usually six months that's really good because it's new to me that um there's a specific time on those a majority of clinician mostly especially manual therapies are aware of those you know and then in passing I have a knowledge. When I explain the pain, it's just more on like basic, like, all right, usually if you have sharp shooting pain, that's from your nerve. And then, you know, that's how that's how I describe oh. when I, I ask the pain. And we also have some referred pain. Sometimes you have pain on your foot, but it comes from your hip and knee. So it's really important. We call it anatomy train. So, so it's really nice that we have, can now answer more more than the basics knowing that when we learn more about pain science so that's that's really good all right go ahead Jim. the, the semi-good stuff about that is that as you're as you're being educated more about pain neuroscience and how it works that it's been shown that there's people end up reporting within about the first year or so about you know that one to ten pain scale we always like asking everyone yes, yes. about a, uh -huh. a about a two point reduction seems to happen within about the first year and maybe by the second year the more that they're able to fill in the blanks and know more about it, mm -hmm. uh, it they they report sometimes up to a three point reduction in in that uh, in that pain scale thing on average or, or so uh, so the human mind is 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 very creative and. When we give really simplistic answers like that, what happens is the mind tends to expand and fill in the blanks of what's not been filled in. So even though the explanations are very thorough, they're very wordy, and they're incredibly time consuming, uh, in, in, a, in a world we, that we work in that doesn't have any time as it is to be able to document, get a, get a patient here on time, get, uh, get this person out and move on to the next patient to move in, uh, it's it's almost like it's forcing us to to make time that doesn't exist in order to try to have these things, and that's why the conversational part is really important. It's because you're we're used to as clinicians we're used to giving lectures and we're used to receiving information in a lecture form, and therefore we like to lecture back at our patients, and it almost seems like it's a, a maternal paternal like I'm the clinician I'm lecturing to you right now or I. Where I feel like I'm, I'm giving you a sermon uh, up, up, up here on the, on, on the pulpit, uh, mm -hmm. and for some reason I found that uh, conversations back and forth with patients, when they're the ones who are asking the questions and I'm answering them, are much more effective for them to want to learn and listen. 
uh, instead. Nice. Uh, so how effective is this stuff? It's just a bunch of words that I'm talking to people, right? And uh, how good is p and &E plus movement? And the plus movement is gonna be really important. We're gonna to get to, to okay. that too later on. So the, the number needed to treat is basically shows the effectiveness of a treatment. And the lower the number that you see in here, the better the outcomes. So the NNT or the number needed to treat uh, is when patients experience about a 50% reduction in their symptoms and dysfunction. You know, so for example, it shows over here where it's got a sad face and a happy face that to improve function with pain neuroscience, about one out of every two people, about 50%, I guess, uh, tend to be, have, tend to increase their function. Mm -hmm. uh, and for pain, uh, in order to improve pain, about one out of every three people that we apply pain neuroscience too. And I shouldn't say apply, but that we speak and we, we, we answer questions about their pain. Uh, one out of every three end up making improvements in there, right? I know it doesn't sound super good, but then when you compare it to this slide over here, this is what uh, physicians use. Uh, for mm -hmm. chronic pain patients, they usually end up receiving maybe gabapentin. Okay. And for one out of every six people that receives gabapentin, uh, about a 50%, you know, in the same time frame that it takes for pain neuroscience education to be applied uh, is, is effective. And then for uh, SSRIs, uh, which is mm -hmm. the, uh, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, so some of those might be your Zoloft or your or Celexa, uh, your Prozac. And mm -hmm. one out of every seven patients that receives those gets a benefit from that, you know? So, What's really nice about pain neuroscience education is that you're being able to help reduce symptoms that gabapentin and SSRIs are able to do twice as effective minus the side effects that, that those uh, type of medications may, may give toward patients in there. Uh, wow. So th there, is, there is a side effect though for with mm -hmm. pain neuroscience education that we found out. And it's basically called, uh, uh, it's when expectancy violation, which is basically information that somebody receives, mm -hmm. even though it's, it's, it's founded by science and supported by science, is sometimes very difficult to change. So unlearning is really tough to do. I mean, how many flat earthers do, do people are, are walking around that, I, that still believe that the earth is flat, you know, uh, even though the space shuttle and everything took pictures of the earth and it's, it's, it's roundish uh, when, when the okay. pictures come back to us. You know, mm -hmm. So sometimes when information violates what their beliefs are, or my beliefs even, uh, the yes. pain can amplify itself just a little bit. But then when the body starts realizing or the brain starts realizing, like, wait a minute, this maybe, maybe Ken did make a little bit of sense when he was talking about those things, mm -hmm. especially I've asked two or three different times and he's come up with, with, with those, those answers you know, when, we, when we talk at the clinic. So then it starts to slowly come back down. Nice. Uh, so, uh, and um, this Ken, is where it's really... NNT? I'll, I'll just go back oh. to the previous slide. The, uh, the yeah. NNT, what's the meaning of that uh, again? That's the number needed to treat. So for, uh, for, for this example, yeah. So gabapentin for every six patients, it, it takes, it takes a, uh, like a, a, a physician, they need at least six patients that they have to give gabapentin to before one of those people can be helped. Oh, uh, and that's that's so how the number needed to, needed kind of to treat. Okay. And yes. And yes. Gotcha. So they they use it a lot. Uh, they use it a lot in 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 pharmaceutical research to find out mm -hmm. how effective a medication is. So, like wow. if aspirin says if aspirin says uh, two to one, that means for mm -hmm. every two patients that they give it to, one will be helped out kind of thing. Oh, yeah, wow. So, and, yeah, and so the, the higher the number, the worse. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then the, the bad thing about that is they begin first in the small dose, like 100, 200, and then they mm -hmm. keep adding and adding the dosage to 300, 600, and still the effects, the, the client is just keep taking all those and they're not even thinking other modification or pain management, uh, you know, they just keep uh, upgrading their um, gabapentin, and especially the SSRI. Um, we yeah. know that antidepressants, they have this 
um, pain, which is more on somatic pain um, compared to that. And that's related to this um, SSRI as well. See? So now I got this. Numbers needed to do. Uh, that's a great point, Ken. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think uh, on top of this, the biggest impact pain neuroscience education had was during the opioid epidemic. And fortunately, the government was able to sort of step in and help regulate a lot of the uh, a lot of the opiates that were being prescribed out mm -hmm. uh, because um I, I guess it was it was one of the things that were that was used to be able to help uh maybe wean somebody off uh, pain medication and uh and this couple with movement is where the magic starts to happen you know because we again uh we're, i'm a big advocate for the movement as medicine you know program yes yes <laughs> uh, yes mm -hmm. That's great so, point. And, and what I'm talking about is that it's so difficult. On the left over here, you'll see a slide that was, uh, this is Rene Descartes' uh, mechanical pain uh, model that he's shown. And over to the right side, I guess, and I guess depending on what you look at the screen, it's, it looks like it's more complex, right? It's, yes. it's, uh, it's got a bios, biological, it's got a psychological, and it's got a social aspect over here and that's what makes human beings human beings rather than machines mm -hmm. uh, so we used to think that that pain could be produced like uh, by the foot when it's stepping into a fire uh, mm -hmm. and that pain signal would travel all the way up the nerve all the way up the the, the spine and right. into the brain and the, the brain would receive that signal like oh get your foot out of the fire we're sending us pain signal so that you can so you can your behavior can move your, yourself away from something that dangerous yeah. fire that your foot is in. Mm -hmm. uh, so the nociceptors. <laughs> yes. Now, the nociceptors and the pain sensors sort of got interchanged, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's this is where it's really tough, is because even in research and even in the uh, even the pain neuroscience community, they 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 don't even have like a standardized verbiage yet that would make things oh. much more clear. Oh, you know, so good. of course it's gonna be even more confusing sometimes to, to have people who are not as involved or, or not as, mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess, excited who, who reads all this stuff more often than, like, than, than I would. And to, it might confuse them even more. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the anatomy, there's never been a pain nerve that's ever been found or a pain sensor that's ever been found. You know? wow. And uh, if, if you ever, it, remember and go back to your cadavers and you look at the, mm -hmm. the, the entire human anatomy, where is that pain sensor at? It, it doesn't exist. They, it's like what you said, it's a nociceptor. Yeah. But nociceptors, mm -hmm. they don't produce pain signals. They produce nociceptive signals. Okay. Uh, so it, it's, it's a little bit different because a nociceptive signal is a danger, uh, I guess, a signal. And if the brain is receiving enough danger signals, it's going to start putting two and two together and start thinking, oh, wait a minute, I'm getting all yeah. this danger signals. There must uh -huh. be something dangerous. Let's produce pain uh, around that region of the body so that we can get away from whatever's causing all that dangerous signals to come up uh, That's over nice. here. That's nice. Uh, and, and like a protection, go away, let's fire this so that he will be more aware that this is happening. You know, That's good. That's, yes. that's really nice. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, so so pain, pain is yeah, pain is really uh it's it's a very poor indicator of the amount of damage or destruction uh that is going on in the body um it's it's very poor at being able to determine that you know but it's very good at determining how dangerous an organism uh, an organism feels like uh, how much danger it's in you know mm -hmm. so it, it's a really good gauge for that instead so mm -hmm. over here, uh, we have Gordon Waddell had mentioned, this is 1988, uh, Louis Gifford had wrote, written a book and called Aches and Pains, and this was taken out of there to where uh, he, he powerfully points out that if medicine can create low back pain disability epidemic, it can also reverse it. Uh, and this is where, again, I think uh, pain neuroscience education comes into play is because if we start giving answers no longer supported by science, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's no longer a scientific-based practice that we're, 
we're, we're, we're, we're practicing that we're honing and crafting our skills, you know, to become better at, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's something else now. Uh, it's science fiction is what it starts to become rather than science based. So, uh, on top of this, it, mm. again, it's very difficult for us as clinicians to be able to start applying things that are new, especially if we've gotten so used to applying the things that we learned straight out of school. We mm -hmm. learn how to use ultrasound machines and, uh, well, thank goodness they got rid of the shortwave diathermies <laughs> of the past. And, uh, uh, and we're still using maybe uh, electrical stim, which isn't bad at all. You know, so I don't believe there are necessarily bad tools that are out there. I, I think there are just bad explanations for how they work. Is okay. All, you know? okay. Uh, now, in 2019, uh, I ran into this paper by Zadro, O'Keefe, and, uh, and Mayer uh, showing that our, uh, quote unquote, our results that physical therapy treatment choices for musculoskeletal conditions are often not based on research evidence. You know, for example, and they continued here with, there was extensive use of not recommending treatments and treatments without recommendations for some conditions. Treatments that were not recommended or had no recommendation were more common choices than recommended treatments. You know, this is off a, a, an evidence-based clinical guideline for managing musculoskeletal conditions. Oh. So some of the things that science was showing were, were the best treatment approaches were not being chosen by many clinicians, but instead they were choosing what was shown uh, in, 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 those, um, in those systematic reviews as some of the worst decisions or, or treatment, treatments to choose uh, mm -hmm. instead, only because that's how we were taught. And yes. again, it's very difficult to unlearn old stuff mm -hmm. so that there's enough mm -hmm. room for new stuff to come in in there. And, and we true. were just creatures of habit. You know? That's so, true. Whatever we yeah. are exposed and used to do it, that's the one that we can keep doing. It's like a habit. It's like a culture. Yes. And uh, especially the older you are, they have difficulty of changing what they used to do. But but if they are keep upgrading themselves, that's why evidence based those cases they are very important that you improve yourself, and then like to learn more each each day, right? So that's really important. Yes. Those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now, now, my parents are living with me now, and just yesterday, I mean, they're just like three days ago, maybe there was a major storm that went through our system in here, and it was raining and everything, and my mom is yelling out, don't forget your umbrella, put a hoodie on and get a ray coat, it's, it's, you're going to get a cold, and I had to yell back and turn around, it's not the rain, it's not the cold, it's the virus that gets you sick, <laughs> and we have more. <laughs> I'd mentioned that we have more susceptibility to when we turn on the heater in the house that we circulate the virus amongst us. It's the virus that us makes sick. you sick. <laughs> yes. Okay, the virus that makes you sick. It's not the cold and not the rain. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> so we're still stuck on that because when you repeat something over and over again in society, it becomes reality. And that's just how it is for, mm -hmm. for, for us when we see those things. Uh, and I mean, even, even this thing, I got a kick out of this. This is a bunch of, these are a bunch of exercises I put on a single slide and I literally just did this just a short couple of years ago where I thought mm -hmm. everything and everyone needs to be able to move and exercise because exercise helps everyone. But mm -hmm. as much as I love it and as much as I love movement as medicine, deep mm -hmm. in my heart, I know that exercise, exercise is not for everyone. Okay. sometimes it's mm -hmm. gentle stretches sometimes it's mm -hmm. breathing exercises sometimes it's yes. visual imagery and mm -hmm. and that's where I, I look at this going oh my gosh I, I I put through some I put people through some things just pushing my own my own beliefs into them now it, it does it has helped a couple of times to where I do have a few patients who were in osteoporosis that were mm -hmm. able to reverse that and go into osteopenia and they mm -hmm, continue to yeah. work really hard to have maybe failed spinal surgeries to where there was non-unions begin to show calcific deposits uh, uh, when, when the physicians were slowly x-raying them dur during the last couple of months each time. So it, it did work out pretty well. And it did help some. I have patients who were stage 
like for cancer, it's still lifting weights because they don't want, they want to fight to the very end and not have cancer, take their mobility away. You know, so some mm -hmm, of the bravest yeah. people I've met are, are some of the patients I work with. And of course, like running and things like this too. And we all know how cool uh, Facebook is and social media. When you see cool things like that, where even the ACL stuff that we didn't realize, we, we didn't believe could actually grow now shows evidence of actually growing. You know, stuff like this gets me to do what I got. And then this part over here with the resistance training, better, being better than the passive stretching, you know, for, yes, for, of course. Yeah. for office mm -hmm. workers. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really important. Uh, all in all, as far as my summary goes, and I know I went like 10 minutes over what I said it would be. <laughs> uh, uh, I think something that's really important is that we need to be able to replace words that harm with words that heal. Uh, you'll sometimes hear about a, gr a good example of when I used to say that it's your disc that is causing a lot of the symptoms to come up. It's that, uh, you know, it's that bone on bone contact that's coming up. Uh, I had to reframe a lot of those things that, you know, your, 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 your knee is giving out mostly because it's starting to feel weak. And if you're, if we're able to slowly start strengthening it, and if you could trust in me that we'll come up with a program to slowly bring your knee uh, to, to the point where you can be strong enough to, to, um, to walk around at least the house again with just a cane rather than your walker, uh, we can get it that strong so it won't buckle anymore in the future. And it'll reduce your risks of falling in the future. Uh, and it'll keep you from ha having to go as often to the physician if your brain, instead of perceiving danger and emergency signals that I'm weak, I'm going to buckle on you at any time. It's going to send your brain signals that I'm strong. I'm resilient now. I have more, I have uh, maybe half a percent more muscle in here that, I, that didn't exist before. Uh, I now have more collagen in, in, the, in the structures that are there. And I now have more uh, calcific deposits in my bones and I won't fracture as easily anymore. And I won't wear yes. out as quickly. You know, mm -hmm. so if the brain is receiving signals like that, rather than the emergency signals, I suspect that the brain will start choosing to not want to cause pain because it doesn't feel like those are danger signals. It feels like those are now durable signals, you know, resilient mm -hmm. signals. Like I have a chance to be able to walk longer in the future. And mm -hmm. if you take away the fear in something, or if, if, if you take away the fear in someone, you usually will take away the pain. And, and that's how I, I usually... So uh, talked with my patients uh, about uh, how to the, how to use the pain neuroscience education. Yes, uh, so, still the brain, brain still above that. <laughs> That's how you um, think. That, <laughs> yes, and 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 one of the last things I do want to mention is that I, I want to make sure that when I'm speaking to a patient that I don't think it's just all in their head because it's very easy to get the perception. Uh, when, when you talk pain neuroscience education, that pain is just in your head. Now it's everywhere. I, I always think that, you know, the brain is our central nervous system, but you look at all the neurons that it's attached to. You look at a tree and all the roots that the tree roots. grows down into the ground. And the spinal cord is maybe like the trunk of where mm -hmm. the brain is at. And all the peripheral Branches. nerves that go all the way out, those are still the brain. It's okay. just, it's, it's made of the same material because that gives the brain the feedback all the way through. Your brain is throughout your body, I, I believe. Uh, so I, I don't think, um, I, I don't enjoy when people sometimes say that, oh, you're saying it's all in my head. No. Yeah, I, they keep I, saying that. I, yes, I want to make sure that I don't um, let them feel that I think their pain is imaginary. I truly believe it's real. And I believe all mm -hmm. pain is real. And mm -hmm. if I'm able to communicate that to them, uh, mm -hmm. then you're you're going to have an ally now that you're going to work work together with and in, in that's in, in, that's in really important yeah. that's really important because um knowing it that's the special importance whenever you see a patient and then history taking there's a rapport okay yes. my clinician my physical therapists believe in me at last, yes. somebody believes that I'm in pain. My husband doesn't believe it's all in your uh -huh. head and then, like that. And uh -huh. then the more it gets worse and knowing it becomes traumatic and it becomes like a chronic pain, you know, because instead I, of physical uh -huh. pain, it becomes now more psychological. It hurts more sometimes like that. So it's adds and adds. But now 
from the fact that when you say that that I respect and believe that they it yeah. exists, I just need to explain where is it exactly. That way we they need to know and correlate that this is where it's happening and this is what yes. we need to work on. That's really good yeah. conversation. I, I've had a I've had a few patients that sometimes will call their husband mm -hmm. and get her on the speakerphone and we're in the exam room and she her husband's on the phone and there he, he's on the phone right now tell him what you just told me that it's real <laughs> so so uh, even just um the, <laughs> even just the environment they have when they get home is already fearful and threatening for them to go back to uh, that, that i have to be able to calm that down before they can before i get them out of the hospital and they have to go get back home then to, to deal with that again. <laughs> mm -hmm, see that. So there are many other factors, you know, but I like when you say we need to abolish fear of movement, um, knowing that, oh, if I move, I will hurt more, <laughs> you know, and th that's, the, that's yes. the challenges that we have. So we need to explain when we do this exercise, you will hurt, but it, the, what's the body's not acknowledge that this is happening. So they will react first, but as the more you keep doing it, the body will be used to it. So yeah. something something like that. So how what you will comment about the delayed onset muscle soreness, um, Ken? Because mm. I explained that as well. That okay, we do this, but you will be sore after. Expect that, and then it will be used to it. Is it still um, okay that the delayed onset muscle soreness is still good to explain, or is it correct? What's your um, knowledge? So that we can yeah. uh, tell to our patients. So the delayed onset muscle soreness, that's going to be something where uh, I, I like telling patients that you're going to be sore but safe. Yeah. And you don't necessarily want to get rid of the pain. One of the first things that people come to see me for is I just want to get rid of the pain. No, you don't want to get rid of the pain. Mm -hmm. Most people who make a goal out of trying to get rid of their pain usually end up for some reason, amplifying it is what we've seen the trend oh, go towards. That's so the majority when you come of my goal. goal. <laughs> Get rid of <laughs> I want to I want to walk pain free. I want to be functional, pain free. <laughs> so now, now uh, originally we we're talking about pain, um, pain being your friend uh, sometimes, and this is where why would I want to be the friend of the devil that lives inside me that's torturing okay. me day in day out. You know, and, and a lot of times it's it's because pain is part of our human behavior. Uh, it, it's something that's ingrained inside and it's actually there to protect us. So mm -hmm. most of the time we we tend to ignore the warning signs and pain is basically um, if you can use your pain as like a speedometer. And if you're let's say you're driving down. Imagine if you had no speedometer and you got rid of it, your chances of getting a speeding ticket might be higher. You know, because you'd have no idea what your what speed you're going. You know, you might be going too slow, and if you're doing that, you get a bunch of people who are cranky behind you and honking at your horn and trying to cut you off because you're you're getting in their way. Or if you're going too too fast, you start thinking that uh, the other drivers start thinking, "Oh, look at that maniac going down the going down the street." So mm -hmm. it's actually a guide like a spinometer, and yes, we all have a, a homeostasis. Symptoms. Yeah, we have all we all have a homeostasis within within us. Uh, some a great example would be our blood pressures. It can't be too high or too low. Our blood sugars okay. can't be too high or too low. You know, our yes. weight can't be too high or too low, et cetera. If, um, if your symptoms are too high and you're doing an exercise uh, it, it, and you're pushing to like, you know, that one out of 10, seven or eight or nine, you mm -hmm. might be at a point where you're redlining. You might be speeding and you're going to get a ticket and you're going to pay for it later on, especially when you have that delayed onset muscle soreness. Because mm -hmm. most of the nervous system is generally amplified much more okay. in somebody who's been suffering from pain than it would be uh, from somebody who's not suffering from pain for a long period of time. You know, so the nervous system has a volume control. And in many cases, the people suffering from pain had the volume control turned way up and their body's forgotten how to turn the volume down. So That's you're basically nice. using exercises, how to guide them so that they can learn how to use the volume control to turn it back down again. And also the way to do that is exposure. And mm -hmm. when you say exposure, it's a controlled exposure. You know, so we're finding out that the people who expose themselves to zero pain and try to avoid it, 
usually their symptoms for some reason tend to amplify. Okay. And if you expose your body just a little bit of, of, uh, of what to do and how to, how to deal with it, it learns how to adapt uh, when, when it's exposed to, to a little bit of pain. But it has to be a dose that's so small that your brain can't perceive it as something that's damaging or harmful. Okay. Uh, it's yes, going to be yes. that sore but safe level. The moment you start pushing it to where it becomes a seven, eight, or nine, mm -hmm. there's a good chance that you're going to go into a maladaptive response because now your your brain might be perceiving, oh, wait a minute, he's exposing us to too much. Ken's going crazy, and he's he's going to damage something if we continue going on in the same trend, you know, and, and, and keep doing what he wants to do. So the the um, uh, uh, Jeremy Lewis has a really wonderful stoplight model for between one, a two, or a three out of 10 pain is what you want to be able to expose yourself to so your body knows how to adapt. And if you, if, there are some people who have what's called a latent response, and that might be mm -hmm. like a delayed onset muscle soreness, but this is okay. a setback. And this is for, this is for people who will sometimes get excited. I feel I had a great day. I did all this. I cleaned the house. I washed my car and uh -huh. I, I, I mowed the lawn because I felt so good, but then I couldn't move for the next three to four days after that. You know, yes, then yes. I, on the fifth day, I woke up again and I felt really good and I started doing all this stuff again. And then I could barely move out of bed for three days straight after that. So that's a boom bust behavioral response. And the people who show, who, who follow a boom bust response show that in the next year to two years, that they'll actually accelerate their disability to become faster. And uh, this is uh, this is stuff that they have on the uh, the VA. Uh, the VA has a really good website for showing a pacing program that the people, mm -hmm. when they take twenty percent, um, let's say they had a bad incidence of the DOMS, uh, the delayed onset muscle soreness, and mm -hmm. they couldn't move for two or three days. Now you've got information here. And you got to tell them, I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want to waste the data that you've gathered and you're sharing with me. Let's cut it back between 20 to 50% of what we did. We did 10 repetitions of this exercise. We did 10 of this exercise and 10 of this exercise. Uh -huh. Let's make it all five reps here, five reps here, and five reps here. Let's see how you do. And if you do well, that's your new dosage. So there's no bad exercises that are really out there, just like there's no really bad modalities that are out there. There's maybe uh -huh. just incorrect dosages that are, that are provided to the patient. And when they come back with that information, now you've got a dose that you can slowly allow them to be able to adapt into. You know, you've heard of the cup theorem, right? Where mm -hmm. uh, you fill up a cup, you fill up a cup when it overflows. That's usually when you've had so much stress that it's your cup can no longer handle it. Yes. You know, we, we tend to find that the people who go through this pacing program of increasing their activities, like vacuuming, if I can vacuum for just six minutes, I can get it. But no, you're going to have to vacuum only for four minutes. Maybe two weeks from now, you're going to go five, have your body adapt to it. Then maybe in two months time, you can go six minutes, but you're going to yes. slowly move up to it and give small dosages. Uh, just like when you were talking about the SSRIs and how you have keep giving small dosages for it to become mm -hmm. effective and more effective and more effective. The same can happen with movement exor and exercise is that if you give it in small increments, and small, small changes, the body can adapt to it and it can actually handle more and more exercise, just the opposite of, of what can happen when you're, you start becoming addicted to medication. That's good to know. That's really great analogy when you explain. There's a lot of things to, to be thinking, especially for all the <laughs> yes. clinicians. For all the clinicians that are listening right now, when they come back again on Monday, they will have a different approach nowadays, different style of explanation, you know, after watching and listening from you. This is amazing, Ken. We really appreciate your expertise and knowledge explaining us because it's really important for us to update ourselves, upgrade ourselves, you know, especially if you have a niche or an idea or passion of learning. So really get into it. So because you did your TPE, you have passion to know more. And now you're able to explain the PNE nicely to us, you know, pain your science education is really important nowadays. Yeah, it, it benefits us clinician, definitely the clients itself. 
So that's and it, and it that's sounds crazy. it sounds easy on paper too, Jen. But it, it's about as eloquent as I I would sound like if I was to try to speak Spanish right now because it truly uh-huh. is a different language. <laughs> but uh-huh, it, uh-huh. it does take time to learn. And I, I wanted to I I mean if I was to give one tip was to continue practicing your eloquence in speaking with pain neuroscience because uh-huh. it will always feel rough in the very beginning, but it does smoothen out later on. And I, I watch clinicians who will sometimes just give up on it because it's too difficult to learn a new language. But if you just wow. change one word each, each week, just mm-hmm. one word each week will eventually build your vocabulary and being able to do that, I think. Thank you. So what are the different resources we need to check out? So if you want to learn more about pain, neuroscience, education, therapeutic pain um, specialty. So what resources, books, or courses you can help us to um, reach out? Oh, I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> uh, should, I, should I stop the sharing thing right now? Yeah, me? sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I think um, as far as resources go, I, I'm going to be also, again, very biased that I, I, I'm, I like... Uh, Adrian Lau's program for uh, it's now part of Purdue and uh, a university. So when you graduate, you're going to end up graduating from Purdue University when you get mm-hmm. to TPS uh, from there now. And they have uh, they have a lot of news research that was not available during the time when I went through that program oh, okay. that I'm even more interested in, in, in learning about. Uh, and and like I said, I, I think stuff like this changes all the time it's just that i don't have the time to be able to commit to finishing up like a fellowship just yet <laughs> over there because i don't have two more years in my life that i, I do want to spend more with my family for right now uh, that, yes, that i'm yes. trying to invest in instead mm-hmm. uh, they're all big now and very successful <laughs> they're, they're are, i think they're taller than you right no. Yes, yes. Uh, and I think most of the time they probably want to hang out with their friends more than me anyway. So. That's <laughs> happening now. Yeah. So I'm so proud of you. Um, congratulations for all this new evidence-based uh, certifications that you're doing, all your volunteers and leadership that you're doing, Ken. So um, thank you so much for this wonderful time sharing your knowledge to us. So any other, how can we reach you? So if they have questions, Ken, so let, tell us more, you know, and then they want to know more. So how can we reach you, Ken? I, it, usually it's, a, I, I'm going to be on like, uh, I guess, uh, I, I think Instagram, it's like a bioplastic dad is what I, I've oh, gone yeah, through over I, there. I and, that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Facebook seems like it's 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 a good resource so far for being okay. able to reach it. I, I I do give out like um uh, like my email. Uh, okay, is the mm-hmm. one that you emailed me in, and okay. there is a there is a a pain neuroscience education one on one hundred one that I know that that Adrian Lowe had given the, uh, the authority to be able to sort of hand out. Wow. Uh, to, okay. to people. So I, I can probably even email that to you if there was anyone else that sure. might be interested in seeing that. And it mm-hmm. was all the stuff I basically skipped over, uh, the, mm-hmm. the, just the very basics uh, of it so yeah. that we can get more into the application part of it instead. That's good. That's good. Thank you so much. I remember I interviewed John Child and then um, yes, he also, yes. yeah, he Thank also you. told me about Adrian Lowe and then he, he's supposed to be one of our speaker and invite him to. So definitely he will be one of that um, to know more about th- pain and science. So that's definitely one of the great resource person for pain, right? Adrian Lowe. I thought uh, at, at I, least uh, in the, I pronounced low, low, should be low. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think they're mostly in the United States, but in Australia, I, I'm I'm a big fan of of the NOI group, where, where Laura Mar Mosley and David Butler are, okay. are part Looking of. So uh, they're they're very dynamic speakers, and and they make boring stuff like this sound more exciting. I think so. Uh, I I think that's what's going to end up really catching your attention when uh, when you get a dynamic <laughs> speaker to speak about these things. 
That's nice. Thank you. And sometimes when they present, they will just have pictures, you know, colorful pictures and blah, uh -huh. blah. So it's really different. So different approach and different. But this is really amazing, especially for basic clinicians like us, knowing what is pain science. And definitely we are like also uh, frequency, like initial dosage, low dosage, not really like a big names and big, <laughs> big names that we don't under. What did Ken just say? <laughs> you know all right so that's oh. that this is really good um basic information for us and we really appreciate your time i know you're very busy so guys if you want to connect with ken um you can connect with his facebook messenger and i will go into post his email as well with his permission if you have some questions and other resources to have all right any other closing information remarks ken and before we say goodbye to our listeners and all no, I, just, <laughs> I just appreciate your time. Uh, I have a passion for being able to spread this stuff out because I do feel like as a whole, just like what you're doing, I absolutely love that you're trying to advance the physical therapy. Uh, okay. I, and I love physical therapy as far as I do want to be able to have us uh, placed much higher on the totem pole of, of for, you wow. know, first, first line care. Yes, as a healthcare professional. That's really yes. good. Yeah, we are having the same passion, loving physical therapy. We would love to improve our clinicians' knowledge because every time I keep saying, why you invest in your um, uh, profession? Why? Because whatever you learn here, it automatically comes out. And who will benefit your clients? And they really know if you know something. They really know if you're doing something for them. So they really yeah. know they're very intelligent uh, clients nowadays. So we really need to step up, invest in yourself. That's why we're, these are really important resources that we always ask for experts, clinicians, and especially like you. Thank you so much, Ken. Appreciate you and be safe there in California. So this is another thanks God. It's Thursday, guys. We have Dr. Ken Tanpinko in um from California. He is a doctor of physical therapist and therapeutic pain specialist. If you have any question or knowledge or passion to know more about pain science, just keep uh get in touch with him, all right? And for more other other courses or other articles that you want to improve or know more about fault preventions, balance and falls, connect with us. And it's me again, Dr. Jenny Yusuf, physical therapist and doctor physical therapist. I'm a certified exercise expert in aging adult and also the vice chair of the Global Health in Aging Special Interest Group. We appreciate you and thank you so much. Bye for now, guys. Thank you for listening.